All right. Welcome, everybody, to our Good Friday, Good Friday, April 14th, 2017. And uh, we are so excited to have my friend and colleague, Dr. Vasco Lopez from Columbia University's uh, Cent I get it always confused. Columbia is a center for anxiety-related disorders, but today we're talking about externalizing because uh, they made a good choice in recruiting him to run that program. Uh, Vasco and I go way back. He was, after he finished his PhD at his doctoral program at St. John's uh, with Ray Di Giuseppe. He then went on to uh, work with Amy Crane Roy up at Fordham, got really good working uh, with kids with explosive disorders there, and then uh, was a child mind with us for a couple of years, and we've both moved on to other gigs since then. And he's now with Emery Albano and the great team over at Columbia. And uh, he and I have spent a lot of time working with really, really disruptive kids. And all of you, if you are PCI tiers, will at some point have a case where PCIT is not appropriate, either by age or other circumstances. So Vasco has been gracious uh, to accept our invitation to talk more about parent training for explosive behaviors, what to do when you can't do PCIT. Just as a way of housekeeping, there's a chat area on your lower left. I'll be moderating that as I accumulate questions that may be a theme. I'll present them over to Vasco. And he can address those. We will be with you until exactly 1 o'clock. And his PowerPoint is downloadable in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, where it says Download Handouts below. And uh, Vasco, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And I have a My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And as always, it's great to be here and uh, uh, and, and make the, uh, the, the terrible commute and trek of the, the, the two avenues over uh, from from Q card over to here. And as always, it's a pleasure seeing you and uh, and spending time with you. And uh, uh, Steve is uh, such a fundamental aspect of uh, my training experience and passion in working with young kids with disruptive behaviors that uh, it's uh, always nice to come here, and anytime I can give back, if you can call it giving back, uh, I'm more than willing to do so. So, um, so I'm excited to, for this talk because I feel like it's such uh, an important and clinically relevant talk um, that goes beyond um, what research manuals can uh, tell you in terms of uh, what ways you can go when you have uh, kids who are disruptive, explosive, and so aggressive um, and had different circumstances where um, you want to do PCIT, but for whatever reason, PCIT is not a good fit. Uh, so we're going to go, we're going to look into that. So, um, how do I get to the next slide? When we look at Okay. Got it. Okay. So when we look at uh, Evidence-based treatments for kids with disruptive behavior disorders, uh, there are various, uh, and our research literature has extensive information on the different types of models and manuals that have been shown uh, through research to be effective in treating kids with disruptive behaviors. So we have uh, parent-child interaction therapy, we have helping a non-compliant child, we have CASN's parent management training, uh, parent management training Oregon model, uh, Triple P, incredible years. Uh, we have very solid evidence that these parent training models help improve uh, uh, children's conditions with externalizing behaviors, ADHD, aggression, uh, disruptive behaviors. And as you get kids at older age ranges uh, beyond the ages of eight, adding in individual child CBT models also begins to improve uh, add further variants of improvement of these conditions. Uh, so at the younger age ranges of two to seven, eight years old, uh, you want to be primarily focusing on uh, parent training models. However, as kids get older, you can add in a child-based model uh, in addition to the parent training. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the parent training. Um, so regardless of what parent training model that you're using, you're going to have uh, very similar principles, uh, and but just different techniques of how they work. So 
all of them, if not most of them, um, are designed to improve the parent-child relationship. Uh, they're designed to increase attention to positive behavior uh, on behalf of the parent um, and to help the parent improve the quality of their praising and uh, help parents ignore minor misbehaviors and increase their ability to demonstrate effective commands and uh, given uh, consequences for non-compliance with commands as well as consequences for non-ignorable negative behaviors like aggression uh, and other uh, more serious behaviors. Um, so um, we have, if we, oh, sorry, uh, to go, I'm going back to this slide. Um, so uh, a vast majority, if not all of these uh, different parent training techniques should uh, incorporate uh, these outcomes here um, that we want to increase. Um, so if we're looking at different mechanisms and components of, uh, of treatment here going down on the left, um, in any parent training model, uh, you, you'll have, uh, you might have some or all of these uh, different mechanisms and components, whether it's special time, praising, using a token economy, uh, using differential attention, timeout, effective commands, and so on. Uh, different parent, parent training manuals will have um, some, if, or if not most, of these components. Uh, the particular type of parent training uh, manual, manual you use will have uh, some of these components more than others. Um, so. Uh, for example, like most parent training models uh, and all of these parent training models actually incorporate praising differential attention, using timeout, using effective commands. And most of them will include some kind of aspect of uh, special time, um, handling public behavior um, and so on. So uh, some of them are going to use a token economy as well and uh, use compromising or so, uh, in these different components. So. Um, you get a good sense of uh, the different components and mechanisms that different parent training mod manuals use. Uh, that's important to know when you're picking uh, the components that you want to work with in doing a parent training. Um, moreover, uh, the, the techniques that you're using within the parent training um, uh, to instill uh, a skill set and knowledge base in improving childhood behavior, uh, they're going to vary a little bit depending on what kind of parent training model that you use. Um, all of them are going to incorporate some form of didactic teaching, role playing, and modeling of uh, parenting skills. Uh, if you don't have those components, uh, you're not doing proper parent training. Um, however, um, only a couple have a live coaching component uh, that includes uh, coaching the parent on uh, providing skills toward the child with the child in the room. Uh, and so the live coaching is limited to uh, parent-child interaction therapy and helping the non-compliant child. Um, and uh, for us PCITers, um, the live coaching is really the most effective way that we can get parents to learn and master parenting skills. And that's the operative term there is skills. Anytime that you are trying to increase a skill set in, uh, in your patients, uh, whether it's a parent or a child, um, if you're not practicing the skill, your uh, mastery or your improvement of that skill uh, is not going to be anywhere near as um, significant as if you uh, do practice the skill. And what better way to practice a skill uh, than with a, a coach right there with you who can give you that skill set and feedback in a live setting. So the example that I often use to parents that I'm trying to, uh, to get them to understand the power of PCIT above and, and beyond other um, other um therapies is um like if they came to me uh wanting to learn how to play basketball uh and the, first of all they're coming to learn how to play basketball uh from the wrong person you don't go to a five foot six portuguese guy to learn how to play basketball but let's just use this example um um, if you're learning, if you want to learn how to play basketball, yes, we can. Uh, I can give you handouts on how to shoot a jump shot. I can. Uh, we can uh, rehearse uh, verbally how to um, shoot a layup. Uh, you want to uh, angle yourself towards the rim. You want to shoot off the backboard and hit it off the uh, the line where it inter like uh, at the like 90 degree angle, and uh, make sure you put some arc on it so that um, it 
it's more likely to go in, into the basket. I can we can verbally rehearse that all we want. We're not going to get anywhere near as good at playing basketball as if we actually just go to a court and start actually practicing playing basketball. So that's the example I often use in terms of uh, the skill set that we're trying to incorporate with parent training um, is very similar. And you get a lot more robust effect when you're practicing the actual implementation of the skill uh, than if you're just uh, going over it in a didactic kind of way. Um, so, uh, so whenever we can, and this is, this is what our research shows as well, uh, uh, PCIT is going to be much more effective during that younger age range uh, for externalizing uh, children than uh, your other parent training models, uh, be uh, partly because of that life's uh, coaching component. Um, so the, the problem is that PCIT does not uh, is not indicated for everyone. Um, uh, so whenever we cannot use PCIT, we know we need other skill sets on our arsenal. Uh, in order to improve behavior um, uh, where uh, we, we can uh, adapt with the challenges that PCIT is limited in. So um, PCIT is going to be very limited in children, one, that are older than seven years old, and it is research-based up until uh, age seven. Um, if you have a young child, if you have a child who is seven, but more developmentally immature and small for their size, you can make the case for why PCIT would be a good fit. Uh, however, uh, a child who is eight years old and uh, normal uh, size for their age uh, will no longer be appropriate. And we'll get into the specifics as to why. Um, also, kids who are younger than seven, but extremely explosively aggressive are also likely to not be a good fit. And also, uh, kids who are uh, bigger than normal in size, even if you have a, a six-year-old who is really large for their age, um, a parent isn't going to be able to carry that kid in a timeout, Especially so you need another skill set and, and adaptation uh, uh, when working with that family. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Coyne, uh, Dr. Kurtz is making a good point that um, uh, we also need to consider uh, caretaker factors as well. So even if you have a child who would otherwise be a good fit for PCIT, but let's say uh, a, a parent is in a wheelchair or you have a parent that has uh, a broken arm or really bad back or uh, eight months pregnant, um, uh, the, uh, those parents um, are also not going to be a good fit for PCIT uh, in that situation. So we need other skill sets in uh, helping that parent ma manage child behavior. So uh, let's talk about why um, PCIT won't work in these extreme situations. Um, um, and it starts in, in PDI. Like if you're doing CDI, um, and, uh, it, uh, that's less of a factor. But once you get to PDI, that, this is where it gets really difficult because it starts with a, a direct command, obviously, whenever, uh, when you're doing PDI. Um, and let's say that the child does not comply. Uh, so now you give a warning statement. If you don't uh, pass me the red block, you're gonna have to sit in the timeout chair. And the child still does not comply. So now you send the child to timeout. Uh, you didn't do what I told you to do. So now you have to sit in the timeout chair. Um, but now the child's refusing and resisting going to timeout on their own. So you're expected to carry the child to timeout. And uh, let's assume that the ch child resists timeout and doesn't stay in the chair. You're expected to carry the ch child to the timeout room. And once they get out of the timeout room, uh, you're expected to carry the child back to the chair if they're resisting going back to the chair. And if and you're you're repeating this uh, cycle as many times as, as is necessary until the child complies with your command. Now, that's all well and good if you have a child that is uh, a, at an appropriate size that you can carry uh, to the timeout chair and backup room. And if they are not explosively aggressive where they can uh, cause harm, because at any point during that carrying sequence of timeout to t backup room, back to timeout chair, um, the child can resist um, 
um, and uh, go through extinction burst behaviors and resist uh, the timeout uh, by any means necessary. So if they are explosive and hit and kick and use objects as weapons and break things that are of significant value that you can't ignore and are uh, damaging property uh, because they're that explosive and or that powerful or big, that's a huge problem. Uh, that can cause pretty significant consequences like parent injury, child injury, parent escalation of emotions and no longer being in control of their emotions and being more likely to cause harm to their child. Uh, the child escalating their behavior even further um, and getting even more explosive. Um, so for any of those reasons, if you have a kid who is really explosive, um, it's going to be re really challenging in a home environment and sometimes even in your sterile PCIT clinic environment to carry out a timeout safely. So when that happens, that's why we need other choices. Um, so when we ask ourselves, what should we do instead of PCIT? I like to first start with doing a functional analysis. So um, if obviously uh, we have antecedents or triggers leading to uh, a child response in a PCIT situation, if the uh, trigger is physically moving your child during a timeout and the behavior is you get explosive aggression uh, and the function of that aggression is to get out of that timeout situation, if the child is explosive enough, uh, they will be able to get out of that situation. And uh, there is uh, very little that a parent can do uh, in a realistic sense uh, to, uh, to uh, not allow that function to happen. Um, so if I'm looking at the function of a behavior that um, uh, of what I want and I'm using a Kasdan-like parent management training standpoint uh, or framework, um, if the, I move the antecedent to a hands-off timeout, I might be able to modify the child's response to a calm or relatively calmer emotional response uh, when they are given a timeout. And we are going to walk through a, a PMT version of a hands-off timeout in a little bit. Um, or if I'm using a Barclays Defiant Children uh, module um, and uh, the antecedent is uh, if the child ex exhibits aggression, they get uh, a response cost uh, consequence like a loss of token or a loss of privilege, uh, I might be able to get a calmer emotional response uh, from the child uh, compared to when uh, I'm trying to physically get my child in a timeout. So. Uh, so we'll walk through these uh, a lot in a lot more detail in a little bit, but I, I just like to, whenever I am trying to pick what kind of treatment package or components that I want to work with within parent training, uh, I, I like to do a functional analysis of what I want to accomplish. Uh, and then that allows me to uh, pick and choose what component, evidence-based components I want to work with. So, um, <clears throat> so it, going back to a PDI uh, framework, um, like uh, we, we run into problems with PCIT with explosive kids or really large kids or with uh, parents that can't follow through on a, a PDI sequence uh, when it gives to placing demands on the child. And in PCIT, that is uh, putting, uh, uh, giving the child a command. So what we would like to see is um, uh, you give a command, the child complies, and the, the, the child gets a label praise. Um, however, if the child is non-compliant, uh, they go into timeout, and if they have to go into timeout, they uh, they have to comply um, with the the timeout and uh, comply with the command before leaving the timeout situation, um, and that's what we expect. However, um, the questions that uh, we have to ask ourselves as clinicians and that we get from parents a lot is, well, what happens if I can't carry my child to timeout? How do I get my child to walk? to timeout on their own? What if they absolutely refuse to timeout? And uh, what do I do to increase compliance if I can't do timeout? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. These are questions that we get a lot from parents. Now, um, if you're anything like me, you get like kind of like two different types of parents. You get the type of parents that when you're uh, finishing an evaluation and you're uh, explaining what PCIT is and what it looks like, you get, well, um, what what if I put my child in timeout and uh, they get really aggressive or they uh, throw a picture frame at me or they um, pull, rip my hair out or uh, I put them in a backup room and the backup room is a bathroom and uh, all of a sudden uh, the bathroom's flooded or uh, they've uh, they've 
uh, totally destroyed everything. Like uh, you get a lot, you'll get a lot of parents that will ask those what if questions. My first que my first response to them is normally, has that ever happened before? What it, or what is the likelihood of that happening? And the, and you get a subset of parents that say, well, that's never happened, but um, it, it worries me. Um, and that just speaks to the severity of the behavior of the child. So if you have a parent where that is their like very catastrophic concern that they're going to become very explosive or really unmanageable and unsafe, uh, and they don't know how to handle it, but it's never happened before, then you have a child that is, uh, or it's happened very rarely, then you have a child that's eligible for a manualized version of PCIT. However, if you ask that same question of, has that happened before? And they say, yes, twice last week. Um, and I absolutely am unable to handle it. Um, I can't pick him up. I can't put him in his room. I can't stop the behavior. Um, he gets so explosive that I don't know what to do. I feel like I have to restrain him when he uh, gets that way, but he overpowers me. Uh, then you have a child who might be beyond PCIT and you want to consider these alternatives. So I always ask that question. And sometimes I get one type of answer, it's other times I get the other type of answer. And throughout your evaluation you process, you're gauging what the, the level of camera. explosivity uh, uh, um, of this child is um, and gauging whether uh, they'd be appropriate for PCIT because of the reasons that we outlined earlier. So. Yes. Exactly. Dr. Kurtz just said it's nice to have multiple skill sets when you're doing parent training so that you're not um, treating all cases with just one uh, specific treatment intervention um, and, and giving parents options. I, I find that like parents that I work with take a lot of solace in uh, I, I'm thinking between this and this, but we have options. Parents like to hear options. If they hear all, if they, all they hear is this is all I got. Uh, I think they they feel a little bit more uh, uncomfortable to say the least about that. So it's nice to have uh, multiple skill sets on your tool belt, so you don't have to treat uh, every uh, everything um, as if it's a nail because you only have a hammer. So that's a very good point. So if I'm uh, comparing and contrasting PCIT versus a uh, a more traditional CASDIN parent management training based. Uh, manual, and I'm looking at the different components that you normally get in uh, in parent training, uh, regardless of the parent training type, um, and, and comparing and contrasting PCIT versus th this PMT. Um, you, uh, you'll you see that the things that if I can't do PCIT uh, that I want to do within PMT um, are as such. I want to focus on praising. I need to develop a token economy. I need to focus on differential attention. I need to go over another version of timeouts. I need to practice effective commands. Uh, I need to go over a uh, loss of privileges. Uh, obviously not in disorder, but um, if I can't uh, if I can't do uh, PCIT, I need to incorporate those kinds of components. So um, uh, so when we are focusing on improving child negative behavior and one of the things that you need to, is obviously you need to provide consequences for negative behavior um, and you need to do a hands-off timeout uh, in order for all of this to work it's kind of like um, within a parent training program for explosive kids it's kind of like chain link like all these different components are like a different link in a chain and if any of the chain links are broken meaning that you're not going over it well enough or it's not implemented effectively, your treatment is uh, can be uh, pretty off and the things that you want to improve might not uh, improve nearly as significantly as if you cover all of these uh, aspects of uh, a parent training program uh, robustly and it gets implemented effectively. So if I'm doing a parent management training and I, I need to go over using effective commands and uh, positive reinforcements and timeouts, differential attention, and reprimanding, um, and I need to cover that well in order for my uh, my child's behavior to improve uh, and for these uh, hands-off versions of timeouts to work. So let's go over them um, in particular. And let's start with effective commands. Effective commands in a parent management training uh, module are very similar, if not the same as in PCIT. So you're, uh, you're presenting didactically with parents and uh, 
and modeling and role playing uh, different rules for uh, commands that increase likelihood of compliance. For example, being specific with your request and telling them specifically what you uh, uh, need them to do, being calm uh, in your delivery of the command, being close in proximity to the child, uh, giving the command uh, um, immediately when you want the behavior to occur so that you can monitor um, the child's um, uh, compliance or non-compliance with the command um, throughout that entire process. Um, given commands in statement form, given no more, prompting no more than two times. Um, uh, parents really underestimate how, uh, how powerful repeating commands reinforces noncompliance and how every time that you give a command and your child does not comply is another instance of them learning that compliance is optional and no consequence will come their way. So at the very least, limit the number of times that you comp uh, that you repeat commands so that you're not continuing to reinforce that non-compliance. Um, considering your child's ability to carry out commands, uh, telling your child what to do instead of what not to do, and overall limiting the number of commands that you give so that you're reducing the odds of getting into power struggles with your child. So uh, none of these um, effective command rules uh, differ at all uh, from a PCIT, uh, a, 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 C, a PDIT, for example, and uh, throughout PDI. Um, so that's effective commands. So when you're looking at positive reinforcement for compliance, unlike PCIT, which is a, a social reinforcement program and exclusively uh, focuses on using the parent's attention as the uh, reward and reinforcement, um, a parent management training module is going to use other types of positive reinforcers. Um, so when you're going over psychoeducation with the parent, you're going over very overview information of how, uh, of how attention to negative behavior still does uh, increase uh, negative behaviors um, and how uh, we need to reward and uh, attend to a positive behavior a lot more than we uh, pay attention to the negative behaviors in order for those positive behaviors to strengthen. The way that you do that is uh, through various methods. Um, I always start with praise because in any parent training program, above and beyond using token reinforcement, uh, the parents need to praise in order to improve that quality of the relationship. Um, and uh, because uh, praise is a reinforcer that you can give at the most uh, frequent interval um, and uh, uh, and still get powerful improvement in behavior. So you're going over ways to make praise more effective, uh, like uh, being specific in uh, the way that you praise, praising immediately after the behavior and consistently um, whenever you see the behavior and often at a high dose. Um, and lastly, focusing on positive opposites and behaviors that you wanna see increase um, over time. So I always start with praising even uh, within PMT. However, with explosive kids, it's often uh, not enough. So you need to, uh, it's a necessary but insufficient um, a positive reinforcer. So you, uh, whenever you're doing a parent management training, you often need to include uh, options of material reinforcers and privileges and activities. Uh, you, you obviously need to incorporate social reinforcers of praise and attention. Um, and lastly, but and probably most importantly, with really explosive kids using token reinforcers. Um, so whether it's a point chart or stickers or uh, whatever kind of token or poker chips, whatever kind of token that you use, uh, token reinforcers are going to be a huge uh, fundamental aspect of improving our child's behavior, especially since we can't use extinction learning uh, like a, a PCIT ma a module would use. Um, so. Um, if we're looking at an older child version of a token system, you're really looking at a, a point chart. So whether you use check marks or points or uh, whatever kind of symbol that you want to use, you're picking your uh, the positively oriented uh, target behaviors that you want to increase that are often positive opposite behaviors um, and given the, uh, given the child points for exhibit whenever you exhibit the child exhibits that behavior. Um, so whenever I'm developing a point chart, I often start with two or three behaviors, no more than three usually, so that the parent gets used to uh, consistently implementing a, a point chart. Um, and I focus, normally I include uh, listening skills uh, to start. 
uh, just like PCIT would have you do. Anytime the child uh, listens within two prompts to any simple command like, uh, please put your dish in the sink, please put your shoes in the closet, please hang up your coat on the rack, um, any uh, instance of, um, of complying with a simple command, uh, they're getting a point for just so that the child gets used to reinforcement and getting uh, reinforced often. Do you differentiate between one and two prompts? Because if, they, if it's um, a point, or any time they comply with into prompts and it's kind of teaching them that they can always not comply the first time. Um, I typically do like two points for the first prompt and uh -huh. then one point for the second prompt. Do you think that's too complicated? Okay. Uh, so uh, Shelly Abney is asking uh, whether I whether um, having the child r uh, respond within two prompts is teaching the child initial non-compliance. Like, for example, if I say, please put your dish in the sink and I'm waiting five seconds for compliance and nothing happens. And I say, uh, if you don't put your dish in the sink, you can't get a point on your chart. Um, I, um, and then they do it and I say, hey, great job putting your dish in the sink. I'm giving you a point for listening, uh, whether that just teaches the child oh, I can get away f with not um, with not following directions uh, for the f those first five seconds. Um, uh, yes, that certainly can happen. And whenever I have a case where uh, the child is improving in their ability to uh, follow directions, but it's only after the warning statement, uh, what I do is then I shape that behavior and I say, uh, all right, you know what, let's um, let's tell Johnny that going forward, the only way for him to get points is if he listens within the first prompt. If you have to uh, repeat it, then uh, he can no longer. Because uh, the child's showing that he's increased the stamina to uh, to listen. However, he's like just doing the bare minimum. And if you raise the bar, uh, he'll be more likely to to meet that. So you use the warning prompt in the same way as PCIT. Exactly. Okay, got it. Um, and I find that it's uh, appropriate because so many of the kids that we treat have ADHD or mm -hmm. some kind of uh, uh, difficulty that makes it challenging for them to either shift their attention or tune in right away to their parents' um, command. So giving them a second. Um, giving them like a, a second well, chance to comply uh, is it can be helpful and get them to like crook up and tune in uh, much more quickly. However, as the child's getting better with that, it's totally uh, appropriate to shape uh, into listening on the first command uh, if that's something that needs to be done. But that's a good question. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Kurtz is uh, uh, pointing out um, accurately how even within typically developing children, uh, it is um, it's not the it's not the norm that children uh, reply on the first command. Uh, parents uh, of even typically developing children have to uh, repeat a command as well. So uh, that that's true as well, and that's great psychoeducation for parents who have the expectation of no, he must listen the first time that I, I say things right away. Um, however, as time goes on, you can certainly shape that behavior. Um, so listening command, uh, a listening goal is normally my first um, uh, goal on a point chart. My second two are, um, my, my second goal is often like a more moderately difficult or challenging behavior. So let's say it's um, uh, the child doesn't get off the iPad when I ask and like you feel like if you use just a regular listening uh, uh, command and only one point that's not salient enough for the child to listen so you need to up the ante with uh, more points uh, the, the the moderately challenging behavior uh, the child gets more points for and um, uh, just uh, uh, hopefully sweeten the deal in terms of motivating them to listen and then uh, then the third goal is normally uh, a more complex behavior that um, that is really or more challenging for the child to comply with and that's often my shaping behavior. So for example, if Johnny struggles every night doing homework, I might put completing homework on my point chart. However, I might start with uh, a shape, like a, a time interval shaping goal of, all right, Johnny, you need to initiate your uh, homework uh, on your own for the next 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I will help you the rest of the way. And as time goes on, as a child gets better at doing that, you can just increase that interval. Um, so uh, I often incorporate a, a shaping goal as that third uh, beha behavior on a point chart. Um, 
And then, so that's the, the a, a point chart. And uh, as a child uh, accumulates points, a parent keeps track of it. At the end of every day, you, you uh, keep track with the child how many points he or she has earned. Um, and uh, over the course of days, you uh, you aggregate how many points that they have uh, that they have accumulated. And at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, depending on how old the child is, uh, they are allowed to cash in those points for uh, for rewards, whether they are privileges or uh, tangible rewards. So, um, so, uh, and for for younger kids, I I don't use a point chart. Like for kids six years old and under. Um, I use like more of a, like a sticker chart towards more immediate tangible uh, rewards, kind of like uh, what Dr. Kurtz does with uh, with uh, his selectively mute kids um, and getting them to in a really robust, quick way, get them to, to speak a lot more. It's because of uh, for those younger kids, it's because of the high power um, token reinforcement that they can get a uh, reward for a, a lot more immediately. So same thing with disruptive kids. Um, Yes, I do. Oh, you're asking if um, if on Monday uh, the child listens within two prompts eight times and on Tuesday, the same day. Uh huh. It, yes. Right. Um. It, do they get the Do they get a reward? Is it what you're asking? Oh, okay. Um. So I, I I'm sorry. I should. Uh. I'm glad Dr. Kurtz asked a, a detail question. Uh. The one point is per uh is per um instance of listening. So it's so continuous reinforcement. Uh, so every single instance of listening, you get a point. So if Johnny complied 10 out of 15 times with my simple directives, uh, he gets 10 points. And on those five times that he did not, uh, just nothing happens. We'll, and we'll walk through that uh, very specifically right now. So, yes. Uh, repeat that last part. Uh -huh. Actually, no, it's uh, based on raw score and uh, just uh, uh, um, so Dr. Kurtz asked if uh, we give rewards based on if you get a percentage of a compliance with goals versus just uh, uh, raw, um, raw frequency. And it's all based on raw frequency. And it's based on the notion that as time goes on and the child gets consistently reinforced, they're going to be more likely to comply with those goals as time goes on. Um, so it's like the more you listen, the, the sooner you'll get a reward or the bigger a reward you'll get. Um, Exactly. So Shelly just said, uh, the, the more you listen, the more rewards or the bigger reward you'll get. And that just can't like uh, from a, our behavioral principle standpoint, that's just going to be a very uh, a virtuous cycle. The more I listen, the more rewards I get, the more likely I will be to listen in the future. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's based on raw frequency of behavior uh, and getting a reward and um, hypothesizing that over time uh, uh, the behavior will increase. You know, I'm constantly asking like, exactly, you know, exactly. Um, yeah. So the the points that you, the number of points that you'll get will vary from kid to kid and from day to day, and the rewards that they'll get uh, will will vary accordingly as well. So. What about the parents who say, um, you know, I'm constantly asking my child to do something. Like, there's no way I can keep track of every command and follow through on every command in terms of giving points because that is just like it's too much to be. <laughs> yeah. So Shelly asked a good question, a very practical question of like when parents say, well, the, that the listening command of like giving a point every time they listen, every time I give a command uh, is just too much. Uh, I give. 40 commands a day. 
uh, that's great information for us to have because we don't want parents to get, be given 40 commands a day. Um, uh, we, we, want to, we want parents to very much limit the number of uh, effective commands that they're using it, it, uh, per day that are requiring compliance immediately. Um, and uh, I, uh, Cheryl McNeil taught me very well that one of the great things about, about using uh, PCIT commands and the, knowing the difference between direct commands and, and indirect commands is that it's kind of a primer for the parent and the kid about listening. So if I say, hey, Shelly, uh, do you want to go outside? And you say, no, I, I'm not going to necessarily follow through with uh, if I, especially if I made a choice for you, like, well, if you don't go outside now, you're going to have to sit in time out because I just gave you a command, right? Um, so that's an indirect command. And anytime, like, uh, I'm given a command that's kind of like a choice for the child, I can give an indirect command uh, because the, the parent and the child knows that uh, it's not going to follow up with a, um, a, a timeout. However, if I give a direct command, uh, like, let's say we have to get out the door and I say, Shelly, please put your shoes on. And you say, no, uh, um, since I primed it with a direct command, you know, and I know that um, I'm going to follow up with a timeout warning and then uh, a timeout. Uh, same thing here uh, with, uh, with our listening prompts for uh, with a parent management training. So if I say, hey, do you want to go outside? And you say, no, I'm not going to say, well, if you don't go outside, you're not going to get a point. Uh, necessarily. However, if I say, uh, please put your dish in the sink um, and you say, no, I will follow up with, well, if you don't put your dish in the sink, I can't give you another point for listening. Uh, and I can follow up with that. So, so what they'll say is that um, for especially kids with ADHD, they need everything broken down into steps. And each of those steps needs to be a direct command because yep. it actually is things they need to do to get out the door sure. in the morning. Like a like morning routine, time. right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that I would say is that's not a simple uh, direct, um, that, that's not a simple directive. That's a, a complex awesome. goal, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever I have like uh, parents say, well, he doesn't listen in the morning. Um, if it's just he doesn't listen when brushing his teeth, then I can like give a point for uh, listening with that that command. However, if he's just so scattered in the morning because uh, he his medication's not uh, in, in his system yet, or for whatever reason, then I'm probably adding that as my shaping goal. And as Mr. that, Trainer, um, uh, like I might start with, out, if you uh, wake up and um, put your clothes on before seven thirty, you get uh, your uh, you get uh, uh, three points, for minutes, example. So and then as time goes on, I'll add steps uh, that will uh, get uh, toward uh, uh, points. May I say your reflections have been stellar. You're obviously a good PCA here. <laughs> Dr. Kirk is saying that my reflections. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Should I hold off on? Um, uh, I'll hold off on uh, questions from the, the very good questions from the field, uh, so that I can get through uh, these skill sets. Dr. Kurtz is saying that my reflections are stellar and that I'm a great PCIT -er. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> um, so uh, if I am role playing with a parent on how to implement uh, effective commands with positive reinforcement, first I'm modeling the skill. So I'm going to start with my effective command. I'm prompting for the behavior. And I, assuming that the child listens right away, I'm going to give uh, a label praise and points, right? Um, so putting that into a specific context, um, if I tell my child, please put your dish in the sink and the child complies, I'm going to say, thanks so much for listening. You totally just earn another point on your chart, right? Simple. We would love for that to happen, right? But uh, often, so you role play this with the parents, by the way. Uh, you act as the child uh, and they act as a parent. You switch roles. You act as the parent. They act as a child so that they get this skill set down. And then you're going into other compliant situations. So let's say that there is a situation where the child is initially non-compliant. You're going to start with a prompt of please put your dish in the sink. And at first they're going to dawdle or not comply. And then you're going to give a warning statement, much like PCIT, but a little bit differently phrased. Of If you don't put your dish in the sink, I can't give you a point for following my directions. And if they comply after that, same thing. I give a label praise and points. Thanks so much for listening. You totally got another point. All right. 
Now let's get into what parents are probably assuming is going to happen, which is complete non-compliance. So now remember, you're not repeating commands more than twice. So once I've given a warning statement, I'm not repeating commands anymore. Instead, I'm de just delivering a consequence. So uh, if I start from the top, I'm telling my child, please put your dish in the sink. And if they don't comply, I'm repeating, I'm saying that warning statement. If you don't put your dish in the sink, I can't give you a point for following directions. And if they still don't comply, I'm saying you didn't follow my directions, so I can't give you a point, but I'm sure you can do better later. And at that point, you drop the command and you're operating on the notion that the lack of further reward is a consequence, which it is. If any one of us don't, if we don't go to work and we don't get a paycheck, we feel that that is a consequence for us. Uh, so lack of reward for a child is a consequence. The beauty of even if the child is completely non-compliant in these situations is at the very least, you have um, avoided a power struggle. You've avoided a situation that could have resulted in uh, a really explosive meltdown from the child and a really uh, significant power struggle uh, between the parent and the child and uh, by just dropping the command and uh, letting the child know that they don't get further um, reward for compliance. Um, so uh, whenever possible uh, in, in situations, uh, that's how I have parents operate. Obviously, you have situations like getting the child to go to school in the morning or uh, attending an after school program or uh, going to bed, um, things like that where you need to enforce compliance. And uh, if this isn't working, then we need uh, like we, we need something more significant in terms of uh, perhaps breaking down the behaviors into bigger sub-steps, uh, increasing the level of reward, or having a very specific program for that behavior. Uh, for example, school refusal, I'll have a separate school refusal program above and beyond a home point chart. So, um, but for simple commands, uh, that's, these are the, the sequences that I, uh, that I would uh, go with. So let's go into timeouts. And sorry if I'm rushing, um, uh, given that we have 13 minutes, I'll, I wanna get through everything that we can. Um, so timeouts um, in uh, a parent management training for explosive aggressive kids is going to be used only at first for physical, verbal, and property aggression. So you're not using a timeout for non-compliance. Uh, that we're using our token reinforcement, uh, positive uh, reinforcement plan for. Um, so uh, it's only used for aggression. And some guidelines for, uh, for timeout are... Uh, um, in parent training are one, you still have to remain calm. You need to use timeout as soon as you see the behavior. Uh, it's kind of like house rules for PCIT. Um, you, we want to, um, if the child does not go to timeout, because it is uh, a hands-off timeout, and we'll get into the specifics of it, um, if, if the child does not go to timeout on their own, instead of forcing the timeout, you just remove a privilege. Um, and that is the, the biggest difference of the, this timeout sequence. And um, when you take away a privilege, you don't need to take away a privilege for a long period of time, uh, especially since you might need leverage for uh, potentially future timeout situations. Like, for example, on a Saturday morning, if the child hits his younger sibling and you say go to timeout and they refuse and you take away screen time, uh, it's going to be hard to take screen time away for the rest of the day as your leverage because how, what leverage are you going to use for uh, the next 14 hours of the day in which the child might be uh, aggressive? Uh, so you want to take um, consequences away um, uh, uh, for shorter periods of time. And you can use, uh, instead of like all of screen time, for example, you can take away just the iPad, but you can still have TV. Uh, or you can take away just the computer, but you can still have TV so that you can have multiple sources of leverage uh, during the course of a day. And no longer for, uh, and whenever you remove a privilege, don't remove it for more than 24 hours uh, is a kind of like a general rule of thumb. Uh, and having parents remember that the immediacy of the consequence and the consistency of it is always going to uh, outweigh the severity of the consequence, especially when you're dealing with um, kids with explosive uh, behaviors. Um, I always include like kind of like black box warnings whenever I work with parents um, with explosive disruptive kids and whenever I'm getting into a consequence territory, since timeout is a consequence and we don't want parents to be consequence heavy, um, we always reinforce that whenever we're incorporating um, 
uh, consequences, we have to make sure that we are reinforcing positive opposite behavior through praising, attending, and point charts. Um, so let's quickly go over timeout rules within a PMT framework. So first you wanna have a clear operational definition of the behavior, uh, which is easier for, uh, for a, a PMT version of a timeout because it's limited to aggression. So it, it could be hitting, it can be uh, kicking, it can be punching, uh, cursing, name calling, uh, breaking things out of anger. Like those are all operational definitions of what warrants timeout. Um, put timeout in a boring location, whether it's a, a chair in a hallway or the corner of a room, or uh, it can be a parent's bedroom um, if they have nothing uh, stimulating in it, um, but putting it in a boring, aversive location. Staying calm throughout, parents staying calm throughout the way. It's helpful for older kids. Uh, just like in PCIT, we, uh, we, um, we model a timeout scenario with the child. Um, it's very helpful to simulate and practice timeouts with the child in situations in which they not they have not been aggressive. Um, and uh, so when you're using timeout, you want to use it as soon as you see the behavior, not after like the child has gotten four or five hits in. It's as soon as you see the behavior. And you don't warn or threaten the timeout. You just go immediately to it. So if Johnny hits, you just say you hit. So you have to go to the timeout chair. Um, and there's no debating or arguing about going to timeout. Uh, we're given long lectures about what they did was wrong. You just enforce the consequence. If the child absolutely refuses to go to timeout, um, I'm sorry, if you, the child uh, goes to timeout, uh, you can praise uh, according to a, a CAS and parent management training uh, module. Um, you can praise them for going to the timeout, uh, which some PCITers might be iffy about. However, um, if we're reinforcing a positive behavior, uh, that is a positive behavior to reinforce uh, compliance with timeout. Um, and if the child does not go to timeout, you want to offer the choice between going to the timeout or losing the privilege. And um, you start the timeout when they go to timeout. Uh, and if after giving that choice, after that warning statement, if you uh, if the child absolutely refuses, you drop the timeout demand and you just take away the privilege. Um, and it, or if the child goes to timeout but something gets destroyed, they have to help clean it up or uh, help fix it. Um, so uh, the beauty about this timeout sequence for a kid who is either big for their age or really aggressive or for parents that for physical reasons cannot carry their child into timeout is it is completely hands off. So the parent, uh, the child has to walk themselves to the timeout on their own, and if they don't do it, the timeout situation is over, and they just get a, a backup consequence of a loss of privilege. Um, so at the very least, if the child is non-compliant with the timeout, it's a quick and easy way of uh, of getting the child a consequence without uh, a, a huge power struggle and a potentially aggressive and dangerous situation for those really explosive uh, kids. Um, Sorry, Dr. Kurtz is saying it heads off the coercive cycle, which I completely agree. The combination of avoiding power struggles with command situations, because if the child refuses and they don't get the reward, you drop the demand situation and you walk away, plus uh, uh, avoiding the power struggle with the timeout um, and just forcing a backup consequence can really um, start healing that coercive um, relationship between the parent uh, and the child. Uh, absolutely. So uh, you have to role play these scenarios with kids. Um, so um, let's assume that uh, with the kids and the parent, especially. So let's assume that the we're role playing with the parent and you are acting as the child and the parent is acting as the parent and you're focusing on a situation where the child goes to time out right away. Uh, you um, then you role you role play situations in which the child is initially non-compliant, um, and then role role playing uh, noisy, disruptive, or escape timeout situations, and then lastly, uh, not complete non-compliance with timeouts. So I'm going to speed through these for the sake of time, unfortunately. Uh, but let's assume you're role playing a immediate compliance. Uh, you give the timeout prompt. Um, you uh, the child goes right away. 
you um, praise the child going right away. You start the timer. Um, the child sits through quietly and you praise the compliance uh, in sitting through timeout once the timeout is over and just reminding them, remember to play gently, r reminding them of that positive opposite uh, for, that, um, uh, for that aggressive behavior. Um, so that's what we all dream of, the child going on their own to timeout right away. Um, and hopefully that's our goal in getting there uh, over time. However, it's unlikely with explosive aggressive kids with a history of refusal of uh, consequences for this to happen right away. What you'll mostly get is the second scenario that you're role playing with parents, which is initial non-compliance of you send the child to timeout. They initially do not go. You warn them of the backup consequence. If you don't go to timeout, you're gonna lose an hour of iPad time. Uh, and now they go because they really want their iPad time and uh, you praise them for going to timeout. You start the timer. They sit through quietly and you praise them for go getting through the timeout and you send them on their way, reminding them to play gently because they hit. Um, so that's an initial non-compliance situation. So the key ingredient there is when there is initial non-compliance with timeout, you're not forcing the child to timeout. You're giving them the choice between either you go to timeout or else you are losing this privilege. All right. Um, very similar with noisy timeouts, disruptive timeouts, or escaping timeout. So uh, starting from the top, uh, if you send your child to timeout and they they go but begrudgingly, and they and uh, you praise them for st um, starting their timeout, you start the timer, uh, and then they are either really disruptive in the chair um, and or getting out, or they got out of the chair. Um, or like uh, banging on the wall or things like that. Since we want to uh, shape and teach um, emotion regulation and uh, calming down in the chair, um, and um, there isn't the three minutes plus five seconds of silence rule, it's just uh, a, a, a total five minutes. Um, and depending on what kind of program you use, like if you have a 10 year old, you can do like a minute per age of life. So you can have a 10 minute timeout for a 10 year old, a five minute timeout for a five year old, uh, et cetera. Um, if the child is dis overly disruptive and aggressive and or getting out of the timeout, you go over and you warn them of either you stay and sit in timeout quietly and calmly or else you are going to lose your privilege. Um, and if they do that, then uh, they, uh, they sit through the timeout quietly and you praise them for sitting through timeout and you send them on their way. Do you start the five minutes over when they get quiet? You can. Um, uh, there isn't a clear, um, there isn't a clear answer to that in like a CAS and parent management training situation, but different manuals do different things. Like, uh, like PCIT, you start the um uh, they have to go in the backup room and the timer starts all over. Um, I think in a couple other parent training modules, that is the case as well. If they don't, if they get out of the chair early, they have to start over again. Um, so uh, I think it's up to the clinician's discretion. Uh, I, I, I would do that. Like the kid got out of timeout for uh, after one minute and is running around for a minute. Uh, I'm not letting that go into their timeout uh, time. So, yeah. Um, then complete non-compliance is actually pretty simple. Um, that is, uh, the child hits, you t send them to timeout, they refuse, so you s give the warning, either you go to timeout um, or you're losing uh, an hour of iPad time, they still refuse. Uh, you're waiting for about 10 seconds, saying nothing else, and then you say, uh, you're making the choice to not go to timeout, so you're losing an, an hour of iPad time. And then you walk away, you do a big ignore. Uh, and you just uh, enforce the consequence, all right? Um, I, yeah, um, so you just do a big ignore and you enforce the consequence. So there, at the very least, you have avoided a power struggle and you're using that backup consequence. Yes, the backup consequence is not as powerful as a timeout. The, uh, the timeout of, from reinforcement is going to be a lot more powerful than a, uh, than a uh, consequence that's happening two minutes or like uh, uh, five minutes later or uh, a half hour later, um, but um, it, it's better than nothing. And uh, uh, given the situation, it's uh, better than the power struggle that would ensue that would inevitably escape the timeout anyway. So uh, I feel like we are out of time. Uh, it's one o'clock. We didn't get through everything else. Um, 
uh, we will continue. Uh, uh, the other things are similar on. to uh, PCIT, except for reprimands, which is at the end. Um, I'm not sure if I should continue uh, with the group that we have here, or, or uh, Dr. Kurtz, or uh, we should take some questions. Or... Or... So we will, folks who need to leave can leave, but they'll be able to download the recording hopefully by the end of the weekend. Okay. I'm and getting word works. that we're going to continue. The show's going on, and whoever can stay on can stay on. Okay, I'm getting word from Dr. Kurtz that since this is also recorded, that uh, um, uh, people that can't stay on can uh, watch it uh, at a later point that and when it is downloaded, um, hopefully by the end of the weekend. So we will continue. Let's focus on attending and ignoring. Um, so uh, when you're going through uh, attending and ignoring psychoeducation with parents in a parent management training module, uh, you're giving them psychoed about the power of negative attention and how in a lot of kids who are extremely explosive and aggressive and disruptive, there's such a skew of uh, getting attention for negative behavior versus that of positive behavior and how that helps reinforce negative behavior a lot more and uh, fails to strengthen the positive behavior whenever you do see it. So. Uh, you're giving the parents uh, psychoeducation that we need to reverse this cycle and stop doing this ratio of attention of negative to positive. So, um, and you're giving them uh, examples of what typically happens in a coercive pattern of uh, parent-child relationships in terms of parent attention. So let's assume that the child whines when he hears no to a request, and the parent attends to that by giving a lot of uh, attention and uh, rationale and arguing and uh, saying, because I said so, uh, why can't you just listen? Uh, why do you need that right now? Uh, why, uh, and just uh, getting into a huge power struggle and uh, negotiation and uh, attention battle um, in that situation. Um, and then if, if the child eventually calms down, Parents normally, uh, before parent training, just simply walk away and ignore that calming down process. Um, and if the child comes back and asking for that request again, the parent revs up again and provides negative attention to that behavior. Um, so in that sequence, what gets reinforced is the parental, parental attention to um, the child uh, whining. I'm sorry, that third child behavior should be the child uh, whines again, not the child calms down. Uh, that is a misprint. Um, so um, by the parent paying a ton of attention to the arguing and the whining, um, it's increasing that behavior. Um, so what we want to do is start ignoring those negative behaviors and paying a lot more attention to those positive behaviors, kind of like you're becoming a detective for positive behavior. Um, so, and you're giving parents a psycho ed and then role playing with them situations like a whining or a uh, an arguing situation where the child whines when the parent says no to some to a request, and having the parent ignore, and then the child having uh, the child calming down and focusing on um, having the parent tune into the child calming down and attending and praising to the calming down. And if the child revs up again, again that's a misprint. If the child whines again, having the parent ignore again. Um, uh, and, and that's the cycle of attention that you want to pay uh, in that situation. And what gets reinforced uh, is when uh, the parent attends to the calming down. Uh, so you're role playing these situations with parents. Um, uh, and you're going over different ways of attending, like how to give pro good eye contact and a smile and providing touch and praise and um, and given a lot of uh, verbal and nonverbal attention to positive behavior and given the parents a psychoeducation that uh, the more you give attention immediately during the behavior or immediately after the behavior, the more powerful it will be uh, in uh, reinforcing that behavior. Um, so when I'm going over skill sets in um, attending and ignoring, I want parents to focus on positive opposites here. Uh, I want parents to tune into what negative behaviors are occurring. So let's say they whine when they hear no and have parents understand what the positive opposite is. So in this instance, handling no calmly. Um, and you have a bunch of different uh, negative behaviors and positive opposites that you're developing with the child uh, in those situations. So, um, so that's 
ways that that's how you increase attending and attention skills for positive behaviors within a parent management uh, module. Um, and when it comes to ignoring, um, uh, you're first going over with parents uh, how to ignore. And I get a lot more detailed with this than um, than I probably think I should, um, especially since I find that parents oftentimes uh, don't really get what ignoring is like. So like those uh, give an example of like they're ignoring their child's request, but uh, actually attending a ton uh, to their request. So if the child asks for dessert before dinner and the parent says no and the child starts whining and the parent says, I'm ignoring you. I'm not giving in. I'm not. We're not having this conversation. We're, we're not doing this right now. Uh -uh, I'm not listening. I'm ignoring you. Uh, they think that that's ignoring. However, what are, you, what are you doing all along? You're providing a really high dose of attention to that whining, that complaining, that uh, just reinforces that complaining to continue to occur. So I walk through very specifically what ignoring is in our book um, so that they really get what ignoring is. And then I'm going over steps of ignoring. So we have to define behaviors that we want to decrease. We're not going to ignore... Um, we're not going to ignore all negative behaviors to start. We're going to pick a couple of uh, behaviors that we're going to uh, ignore at the beginning and the rest uh, handle how you normally would handle. Uh, and over time, you can incorporate more behaviors that you ignore um, and decide what kind of ignoring to use, whether it's walking away, whether it is uh, differential attention, whether it is uh, pretending like you're doing something else, just turning your back, whatever, um, and then deciding at what point along the sequence of that behavior to use it, and uh, what positive opposite behavior uh, are you going to wait for to return your attention? And that is such a key aspect. The return of attention once the uh, once the negative behavior has stopped is something that most parents don't get about ignoring. So uh, we go over that very specifically. Um, so let's define some negative behaviors that we want to ignore. Um, we have to get operational definitions. So whining actually isn't a very good op operationally defined negative behavior in and of itself. Dr. Kurtz just asked why whining is not a good operational definition while using a whining voice. And I know that it was a whine because he used a sing-songy voice in his complaint. Um, so that is a, a, an example of an operational definition of whining. Uh, arguing is also not a good operational definition. Uh, Dr. Kurtz is um, asking uh, why arguing is not uh, by actually arguing with me because he is um, refuting or talking back um, after I have made my statement. Um, so uh, any for arguing, my rule um, is if the child refutes or talks back uh, more than two statements before complying with something, uh, that is considered an argue and tantruming. I'm ready. I was waiting for it. <laughs> Dr. Kurtz. Is, <laughs> Dr. Kurtz is now tantruming. <laughs> Dr. Kurtz is now tantruming. Dr. Kurtz is now tantruming to show a tantrum, uh, and specifically, he was stomping his hands and uh, and yelling. And we can further operationally define tantruming by throwing yourself on the floor, stomping your feet, um, and other behaviors like that. So the more specific you get, we did not rehearse that, by the way. <laughs> um, that's what you call good rapport. Um, so the more specific that you get in your operational definition, the better able you're going to be for parents to ignore, not just within one parent, but in inter-parent. Um, so if one parent has one definition of a negative behavior and the parent has a different definition, uh, then you're not going to get improvement uh, on the, the behavior because you're not going to ignore as effectively. So operational definitions are a must. Um, then you have to decide on positive opposites so that you know when to return attention. So the opposite of whining is asking for something calmly, uh, asking for something in a calm voice only one time. Uh, the opposite of arguing is speaking calmly and accepting directives or limits. Uh, or the opposite of tantruming is uh, remaining calm with your voice and body when you're frustrated about something, for example. These are just examples, and you can include other examples. Um, so now that you know um, when to, uh, 
now that you know the positive opposites, you know when to return attention uh, and you can return attention right away. Uh, Dr. Kurtz taught me very early on when I child, started at Child Mind uh, with him that ignoring, it should be called ignoring plus. It's ignoring plus return of uh, attention for positive behavior. Your ignoring is not over until you have returned attention um, of once the child has resumed a positive behavior. So um, that is very important. All right. It's also important to give parents the psychoeducation about uh, behaviors that are effectively ignored, like whining, arguing, tantruming, interrupting others, purposely annoying others. Those are all really effectively ignored behaviors because they are driven by uh, parent attention or attention from others. So if you stop giving them that attention, these behaviors will soon extinguish because they're not getting reinforced. Um, However, um, other behaviors that occur with disruptive, aggressive, impulsive kids um, can be less effectively ignored. For example, running around the house, jumping on furniture, roughhousing with siblings, aggression, playing ball in the house. Um, those kinds of behaviors are less effectively ignored because they're self-reinforced. I can play ball in the house all day long. If my parent ignores me, I'll just keep playing ball in the house. Um, it, uh, them, uh, my parents uh, watching me or commenting on it might not necessarily uh, increase my, uh, me playing ball in the house. Uh, there's something self-reinforcing about those behaviors um, uh, or reinforced by something other than parent attention. So it's important to, dis to delineate with parents, like when they say, oh, my kid was, uh, was uh, um, playing uh, the drums at the dinner table with his knife and fork and we ignored it and he kept, just kept doing it. Uh, that's likely because um, it's, there's something self-reinforcing about it, and it's good to ha for parents to have that uh, that psychoeducation. Um, or were they really not ignoring? Or exactly, or <laughs> were they not really ignoring? Um, so, uh, w especially with explosive kids, it's really necessary to warn parents about extinction bursts, uh, especially since the extinction bursts can become really aggressive. So you're giving parents the, uh, the psychoeducation that so long as the extinction burst behaviors are safe and tolerable, continue to ignore it because you don't want to reinforce the escalation of that behavior because you just teach the, behavior, the child to escalate the behavior next time. However, if behavior becomes unsafe in any way, whether the child is grabbing a knife, if the child is uh, trying to uh, leave the apartment or leave the house, if the child is um, is uh, grabbing a picture frame that can break and shatter, and it's like a very uh, uh, it's a very valuable uh, kind of object. If they're being unsafe in any way towards themselves or others, um, then do what you need to do to ensure safety. Uh, so break the ignore and handle the behavior to how you need to handle it. However, as long as they are being safe, try your best to ignore it. Um, if the extinction burst winds up being aggressive towards uh, the parent, uh, let's say you uh, said no uh, to the child's request for the iPad uh, because it's not iPad time and the child uh, started becoming aggressive um, and is targeting the aggression onto you, you can do a swoop and go of yourself, literally uh, leaving the room and kind of like uh, closing yourself off in uh, another room, creating separation so that uh, you're um, so that you aren't in danger of uh, getting hurt or hurting the child uh, because uh, the child is that explosive. And what if the parent is concerned that they'll then destroy everything in the room because the child actually did? If that is the case and they actually would, then handle that the way they need to handle it. So if they need to make sure the child stays safe and is not going to hurt themselves or uh, or hurt others or um, break very valuable things, um, handle that the way they need to handle it. Um, so with kids who are very, uh, like if, for kids that had the propensity toward this, who are very unsafe towards themselves, others, and uh, valuable property, uh, you're walking through different scenarios of, all right, if they're aggressive towards you, let's practice you leaving the room and cl uh, closing yourself off in uh, your own safe room. So that is a scenario where if you say, oh, you've lost your iPad, um, then the child would get aggressive toward the mom. The mom 
has been instructed to then go into a different room, lock herself in the room, and, and then the child will break everything. And then the child, if the child starts breaking stuff, the parent should handle it the way they need to handle it, ensure safety. If they have to call 911, call 911. Uh, if they're unable to, uh, the child's really unable to uh, bring themselves back and are really being unsafe, uh, you're walking through uh, that sequence of events um, with the parent, you can practice it with them so that they feel more confident and confident in, um, in doing so, uh, so that uh, they feel more skilled in, in that sequence if that should happen. So um, unfortunately in this population, that is a conversation that you need to have and walk parents through in kind of a safety plan. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, if uh, calling 911 can serve as a consequence uh, in and of itself for when kids become extremely violent, unsafe, and aggressive. Um, it could be. For, for me, it's not a matter of having it be a consequence as much as it is ensuring the child and the family safety. Uh, anecdotally, uh, I, I can say that like uh, I've had kids who have become a aggressive and been unable to bring themselves back who have wound up uh, having to go to the emergency room and whether they get admitted or not have realized like oh that really was not a good experience uh, I don't want I don't want that to happen again uh, and have been able to kind of prevent themselves from escalating to that point however that's not true in uh, every situation uh, you have kids that absolutely cannot control it once they get to that level and the next time they're uh, just as likely to uh, I have uh, 911 have to be called. So it, de it depends, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so that's ignoring an extinction burst. So let's go over reprimanding. Reprimands are gonna be used in a parent management training module for um, behaviors that you wanna stop that are not ignorable. They're kind of like the self-reinforced negative behaviors that we talked about, um, um, but have not gotten to the point of, um, of uh, needing a timeout. So uh, it's not aggression, it's not, um, it, it's not uh, cursing, it's uh, just more mild disruptive behaviors that are self-reinforced. So reprimands are technically a mild punishment technique where you provide verbal and nonverbal expression of disapproval uh, and use for self-reinforced behaviors that need to be stopped. Uh, for aggression, we're not gonna use reprimands, we use timeout. Um, and let's walk through some reprimanding rules, all right? Um, you want to use a firm, assertive, yet calm tone of voice. You don't want to yell, but you want to sound assertive in your voice. You want to, you don't want to be as mild and pleasant as a, a general command. Uh, you want to be close to the child when delivering a reprimand. And reprimanding consistently. Reprimand every single time you see that instance of behavior. And because you're being consistent, you want to start with only one behavior. You're not going to reprimand seven or eight different types of behavior. Otherwise, you're going to be reprimanding left and right, and you're just reinforcing that vicious cycle that you of a coercive uh, parent-child relationship that you were trying to uh, improve uh, over the course of your treatment. Um, you want to physically terminate uh, dangerous behavior. So if the child is um, standing up on the ledge of uh, your 10-story apartment, um, uh, tenth floor uh, apartment, and uh, he's in danger of opening the window. You don't give a reprimand and get that sequence. Just remove him, uh, terminate that unsafe behavior. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's walk through. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so just uh, the comment again on that slide of uh, behaviors that uh, we want to use reprimands for. We're, we're instead of ignoring those behaviors on the right for the self-reinforced behaviors we want to use reprimands for since um just letting that behavior go is not going to improve uh, the behavior outright since they are self-reinforced so um some steps to reprimanding one is um being specific in the behavior to reprimand so let's say we're reprimanding um running in the house you live in a new york city apartment your floors are uh, thin and, creak, uh, and creaky and your neighbors complain all the time about your kid running in the house. So whenever you, you see the kid running in the apartment, uh, you are going to reprimand it, all right? You give the reprimand as soon as you see the behavior. And the, the specifics of the reprimand include what behavior to stop, why to stop it, and what to do instead. And for me, number three is the most, actually number two and number three are the most important things. Whether you use what to stop, I think is semantics. 
Um, but for me, like including the rationale of why the child needs to stop that behavior and what to do instead is the like most effective component of that. Um, if the child complains of, uh, um, if, if the child, I'm sorry, if the child complies, you praise the positive opposite. You can give a point for, um, you, you can give a point for uh, listening uh, right away. However, since this is later in your parent training um, sequence, like it's like week eight or nine, uh, hopefully you're not giving um, uh, token reinforcement for simple following directions as frequently. You want to start weaning off of that and just focusing on uh, token reinforcement for bigger goals. Um, but you absolutely should praise. If the child does not comply with the uh, with the reprimand to uh, with the alternative behavior right away, you give a choice between either you comply with that behavior or you get a consequence. Um, and it can be time out or loss of privilege. Um, and if, just if, if they comply, the give the uh, praise. And if they don't, after that warning three, statement, you uh, just uh, enforce the consequence. Like this. All right. The neighbors, are, the neighbors are hearing the footsteps. Exactly. Please walk calmly in the house. Yes. Is not at yeah. Yes. And hence, yeah, hence why um, I believe that, uh, and again, this is my belief that uh, we can, you can avoid step one of what to stop um, and uh, just instead uh, include uh, the rationale and uh, what to do instead. Um, and you could just post like, kind of like as a house rule of there is no run in the house. Uh, so that the child knows uh, that in advance. So um, yeah, and after that, it, it, it's uh, it's like it's a very much like a PCIT positive opposite command rationale and a, a direct command. Absolutely. Um, so let's walk through different scenarios. Let's assume that the child complies right away. So if the child's playing ball in the house, um, and you say stop playing ball in the house, something can break. Please play ball outside, uh, and the child does it right away. Uh, the parent praises and, um, and yeah, the child praises. Thanks. Thanks for playing outside. I really appreciate that you're following my directions. So um, very similar to a, a PDI command with compliance, right? Very similar to a, uh, um, a effective command in a, a PMT version um, with compliance. Now, let's assume that the child is initially non-compliant. So if you tell the child, please stop playing ball in the house. Something can break. Please play ball outside and the child refuses, <clears throat> you now say either you play ball outside or you're going to get a consequence. Now here in the parent management training literature, uh, the parent is given the option between uh, taking a privilege away or enforcing a timeout. Um, and here I would use discretion as the clinician as to the uh, parent's ability to enforce that timeout. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, explain further in a little bit. So let's, let's assume, for example, you're using timeout. Uh, you, you'll say either you play ball outside or you're going to have to take a timeout. The child complies, you praise again. Thanks for, thanks for listening. I really appreciate you playing ball outside. All right. Now, if there is complete noncompliance, um, start from the top. Kids playing ball in the house. Um, stop playing ball in the house. Something can break. Please play ball outside. Uh, child refuses, so you say either you play ball outside or you're going to have to take a timeout. Uh, st child still refuses, so you let them know you're making a choice not to follow directions, so uh, now you have to take a timeout. All right, uh, man, the child goes uh, to his, uh, his room or your room for a timeout. All right, um, so that is complete non compliance in using a timeout as the consequence. And for me, and I think for most of us, that would be much more effective, especially for that particular behavior, because it's extinguishing the uh, reinforcement value of uh, the ball plane immediately, right away, right? So for me, that is going to be a lot more effective. However, if you have a, a very explosive kid um, and um, uh, uh, and that timeout situation could just escalate him further, uh, you, um, it, that might not be as appropriate, and we'll explain what to do further. Um, but before that, let's go into uh, what could happen if you use timeout as the consequence, um, but the, uh, the child's refusing to go to timeout. And this is where it gets really complicated. Ready? So starting from the top, it's kids playing ball. Uh, so you tell them what to stop. 
uh, why to stop it and to play ball outside instead. The kid refuses. So you warn either you play ball outside or you're going to have a timeout. Kid still refuses. So you say uh, you made the choice to not follow directions. So you have to get a timeout. Now the kid's refusing to get a timeout. So now you say uh, either you get a timeout, you get 30 minutes of screen time off and the kid still refuses. So you say, all right, no more screen time. That's a long sequence for a parent to memorize. Uh, so if you have a parent who's struggling more with uh, uh, memorizing this kind of script and implementing this kind of skill set, uh, it would be really hard for them to remember this entire sequence. Um, this is a uh, this is on par with a, a PDI command with a, back, a repeated backup room, um, and um, so you either have to rehearse this skill set with them over and over again for them to to get it or your parents have to be kind of with it and really uh, and, and really good at memorizing this kind of script in order from the, for them to understand it and get it down. So um, so this can be really hard to implement. However, when you can implement it, I prefer that to uh, to just simply taking away um, a privilege. For example, if a child's playing ball in the house and I say, uh, stop playing ball in the house and they say no. And I say either you uh, uh, either you play outside or you're going to get iPad taken away uh, for the next hour. And he says, I don't care. And you say, well, um, now you have no more screen time for the next hour. And he's continuing to play ball. Um, perhaps I need to uh, like what if I need to physically terminate that behavior because it's dangerous or neighbors will complain or uh, I can't let that behavior carry on, um, then I need to physically remo remove the ball and then I have a power struggle all over again. Um, or if you really can tolerate uh, that negative behavior, whether it's ball playing, um, you just have to suck it up and deal with it that, uh, all right, the, uh, my kid didn't listen and stop playing ball in the house uh, and he's continuing to play ball in the house right now, but he got a consequence, there's no screen time for the next hour um, and you just have to suck it up and deal with it. However, the learning of um, uh, that extinction learning of, uh, of shifting from playing ball in the house and doing something else, it, um, that learning isn't happening. So uh, that can be a problem. So that's a limitation, but that is something that you can do if you have a kid who will become absolutely um, explosive if you were to physically remove something from them. So, um, so those are core Kazin like PMT strategies that I just went over in different uh, in different session components. There are other strategies that can be um, that can be uh, incorporated. You can use compromising, which is included in several parent training manuals, including uh, Kazin. Um, so if, like it's and this is helpful for um, predictable, repeated uh, situations in which there are power struggles. Like for example, uh, what time the child does homework um what dinner options um i can eat every day what time i have dinner um order of when i take a, a bath or a shower um what kind of after school activity i uh, can choose things like that it's helpful especially for older kids who are explosive uh to use more of a compromising and problem solving route of of trying to prevent these triggers from happening in advance by coming up with an agreement yeah. that you Overlap. and the child are both okay screens, with. Collaborative yeah. example, problem if problem. you get into repeated uh, power struggles over um, what time the child does homework, like if the child wants to do homework at five or at six o'clock, but you want them to do it right after school, you can compromise and say, all right, why don't we do it at 4.30? Um, that's an example of compromise. And if, and if the child is able to stick to that, then you have a good situation there. Um, you can okay. use, yeah. Exactly, uh, Dr. Kurtz is saying um, uh, uh, Ross Green's collaborative problem solving is essentially all uh, uh, somewhat compromising um, and trying to solve triggers through compromise, which has its merits, but also when using that as your sole uh, skill set on your arsenal, uh, you're going to be very limited because you're going to inevitably have situations where you do have to get your child to comply and that you can't compromise on. So, um, so. Um, so yeah, uh, Ross Green's uh, um, uh, approach is an example of uh, compromising. Uh, you can use response cost uh, as a way of consequence if a child is aggressive or if the child is non-compliant. Um, you can take away points in a pure casin like parent training. Uh, you don't take points away; it's purely positive. Yes. However, you can incorporate it if you need. 
Uh, so that is an option as well. Um, so that is our presentation. Um, we've answered questions all throughout, so we can skip it for this portion. Um, I would encourage everyone to check QCard out and come visit us if you get the chance. Uh, we have great services for, uh, for uh, anxiety for kids, young adults, and adults uh, in different formats and groups. We have uh, individual CBT, we have PCIT Calm, much like what Dr. Kurtz does here, um, and, uh, and our program for ADHD. Say something more about the camp? And our program for ADHD, uh, we're, we're disruptive behaviors. Uh, we are doing a lot of exciting things that uh, piggyback off of things that I uh, honed and uh, got much better at and working with Dr. Kurtz, PCIT, parent management training, uh, and those sorts. And we're launching a school camp a school readiness camp for kids with ADHD and disruptive behaviors, uh, which is really exciting, and we hope to get off the ground. So, sure. Uh, so we're we're launching a um, a uh, camp called the School Readiness Camp. It's for uh, uh, young kids with uh, disruptive behaviors, whether there's a formal diagnosis of ADHD or not, and focusing on evidence-based behavioral training skills uh, for kids between the ages of five and eight. Of uh, giving um, behavioral modification programs throughout the day, focus on social skills and incorporating and improving behaviors like sharing and sportsmanship and frustration tolerance and things like that, as well as core classroom skills of transitioning Pasco, and listening. Uh, 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 I'm hoping you get a good registration, uh, and you're probably recruiting for counselors as well. Yes, we are things like counselors that. So, like well. having them feel really ready for school by the time September rolls around. So. Uh, you just don't uh, uh, pick uh, from our lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. By, well, by all means, uh, and then my <laughs> way, um, they're well uh, trained. Have them. It's so a really exciting uh, program that we're getting off the ground. So. Uh, it is. Uh, Thank you for the plug. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be happy to share. <laughs> Understood. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Uh, this is really an important set of, of viable options because uh, there's no way the PCT meets everybody's needs for the, for the variety of reasons that you laid out um, and very thoughtful approach. I feel like if I were a parent, I'd be confident you're taking me on a hike you've been on before um, and you know where the pitfalls are and you know what equipment I'm going to need. Um, No, that's, those are all very good points. Uh, like, like we said in the beginning, it's so helpful to have multiple and skill sets on your. The other things that, that, that this has that uh, PMT has in common with PCT uh, is like the consistency PCIT, and the predictability. Like management training and so, for example, uh, as a subset, it doesn't matter whether the time is two minutes and forty-seven PCIT seconds, or three minutes and twelve seconds, or five minutes and nine seconds well. plus five seconds of quiet. As long as that's consistent and predictable, uh, that'll trump everything. The uh, in, intra and interparent consistency of whatever skill sets that you're incorporating and making sure that it's concrete and uh, immovable is the important thing. Like, so it's, it's hilarious when you hear clinicians argue between, wait, no, a timeout needs to be three minutes. No, it needs so to be reflecting one minute per what age. you said, that, uh, that in one protocol we, we announce specifically and, uh, what the length of the timeout is, is, and the other one we specifically uh, so avoid right. announcing. <laughs> I think A, the predictability and consistency trumps everything, and B, for the parents who are bothered by, or the therapists who are bothered by not being able to tell the child what the number, of, what the time is, I say outside of that timeout that just happened, educate them all you want. Tell them when you're in timeout, you're there for about three minutes, it's, and you're 
you need to be quiet, and I will tell you when you're ready to get up. If all of that is said outside of the timeout, that's great psychoeducation. If it's said in the middle of the timeout, it has another name. Extra talk and reinforcing probably inappropriate behavior. So I'm all about the education because therapists and parents can be uncomfortable with what seems like you're not giving the kid all the information they could benefit from. And it's about setting them up for success, not about setting them up for frustration. I totally agree. Like, in The one technique, though, that you said that I would have trouble picturing working is role playing with the child they're misbehaving. Right, I totally agree. Um, um, I feel like. Simulating role playing, role uh, playing and explaining outside of situations. The timeout procedure. I think what you said was is, uh, we go through with the child uh, role playing. Mm -hmm. They're sitting um, in timeout and for like, misbehavior. And, oh, okay. Um, no, and, and, and reviewing it with the child uh, periodically. Oh, awesome. like, uh, sorry, if that was unclear. Uh, and have the parent actually uh, sit timeout yeah. as if they were. The, uh, the little sort of subtext in PCAT that people sometimes use is Mr. Bear or having a, an animal pretend to be the naughty one. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I don't use it often, when I've seen it used, it looks like really good. Uh, and the two times that I have done a variation of what you described was when I had kids pretending to put me in time after this behavior. They demonstrated knowing the script really well, and it showed their teachers, because I was having them model with me to their teachers, and they nailed it, and they loved it, and... Uh, Little Stevie got to be bad for a couple yeah, of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thank you again for an awesome presentation. This is going to yeah. be something that I think as an independent seminar for some of our attendees to do with their trainees will be awesome. We had 20 people share their Good Friday with us for the full hour. Uh, so uh, thank you again. My pleasure. It's great to be here. It's great to, uh, I mean, it's uh, uh, a um, topic that I'm really passionate about because I think it's so important.